events. Um, guys, it's been like what? Since I, I think like we were talking better. July, like it's been months since we've been back together. Unfortunately, Dr. Katie wasn't able to join us today, um, the last minute, but we have an amazing topic with yes. the amazing experts here, Pam with Perfectly Holistic and Julianne from Naturally Cats. Um, so, so excited to talk to you guys about itchy skin in cats, which is a very common issue that many cats uh, struggle with. And I know like when it comes to the pet world or pet health world, it's very, it's very talked about when it comes to dogs, but when it comes to cats, not a lot of, not enough people in my mind are addressing this issue. No, it's always the way though, more for dogs than there is for cats. Always, yeah. always, yeah. yes. To be fair though, I do think that it might be a little more common with dogs. Well, people see it a little mm -hmm. bit more, right? So mm -hmm. you might, but, but we'll, we'll discuss all the reasons. Mm -hmm. Are why our kitties might be um, having itchy skin and uh, what contributes to that. And then we'll be giving you guys some actual real life uh, remedies that you can use to help your kitty with itchy skin. So let's start off for anybody that might be new since July and doesn't know who That's these beautiful. lovely ladies yes. are um, and with a, with a short intro, Pam. Hey, well, I am the founder and CEO of Perfectly Holistic, and basically I'm a holistic cat lady, and I love educating and empowering cat parents to learn how to apply more of a holistic approach with their kitty's health and well-being. Um, I am a slave to four precious babies. <laughs> <laughs> Not we understand. One of them, which is howling in the background right as we speak. I was wondering if that was yours. <laughs> yeah, it was Gunner. He, he he probably wants outside again, which, you know, it's chilly. He doesn't want to stay out for like five minutes and then he wants in. You know, it's that it's that dilemma. That's out great. or in. And I can't leave the door open because of the kittens. So yeah, here we are. <laughs> you have a full you have a full house, and we're so grateful for the work you do. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yep. I love energy work. Uh, Julianne and I both have a passion for energy and energy healing and energy work. It's powerful. It yes, is powerful. It is I have powerful. to say, Julianne, you are one of the biggest sneak attacks of my life, I have to say. <laughs> uh, because we, we were doing roundtables with you for a year or more uh, before we really um, used your services. You know, we know what you do and we love your herb gardens and all of that, but to really mm -hmm. uh, book a consult with you and be part of what you do, uh, kind of life-changing. Yeah. <laughs> really. Is. So for anyone that doesn't know you, you never give an adequate intro in my opinion, but try. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I don't like to talk about me. I like to talk about the cats, <laughs> but thank you for your beautiful words. That, that really puts a um, sparkle in my heart. So thank you. Yeah. My welcome everybody. And hello, nice to meet you. My name is Julianne Thorne and I created Naturally Cats. I've got two boys of my own, Leo and Baby Max. I've got two books. You can see one here, Cat Chakras. My other one is The Aromatic Cat, which is, as um, Adrian said, about using herbs and hydrosols and essential oils. I mm -hmm. use uh, energy work with cats, so I offer chakra cleanses. And I've got a new program, which has become a soul-led cat guardian. So I'm helping people to connect with their cats. So I kind of call myself a holistic cat therapist and now a soul activator for cat guardians because I, I want to change the world. You know, my mission is to change the world's perception of cats. And in order to do that, it's about helping people to understand, to hear their cats, receive their cats and to really connect with their cat so that's that's my mission and I'm so honored to be here with these beautiful ladies and like you said so sad that Dr Katie couldn't join us but it's a great opportunity for us to to speak to cats uh, to speak about cats and to give you guys some hints and tips you know tonight on itchy skin so thank you for having mm -hmm. me Yes, oh, uh, I'm so fun. glad you're. And it's you're funny because last time we uh, we had a round table, it was still light at this time uh, where you are. But now that the weather is changing, that the seasons are changing, it's like it's it's all dark and it feels um, it, it feels fun. I like this time of year. It makes me happy. Hey, we're going to kick this off with an awesome comment by Feelings One on YouTube. I changed my 15 year old cat tiger to a single protein food and also use your feline essential catalyst, itchy skin and sores are gone in two weeks. Oh, so this is, so this is some great, great information, right? As far as like different ways that us as cat parents can kind of get to try to figure out the root of why our cats have itchy skin, right? And getting to the root is what holistic means, right? And so there's, you know, there are a lot of things that, that we can do and sometimes need to do to treat symptoms, but 
overall, we need to get to the root so that we see it as a whole, right? We want to get to the to the root of why our cats are having inchy skin. And there are a slew, 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 slew. Yeah, yeah, there's, I mean, there are a ton of reasons why our cats might experience itchy skin. Um, and so let's address, like, first of all, you know, the very common ones, obviously fleas um, and, you know, topical type issues. Ringworm can be itchy, feeling mm -hmm. acne can, can be itchy. So like the topical type issues, um, and obviously we, I'm going to say obviously, I feel like that's my word today. Obviously Obviously is. is my word. <laughs> in advance. Um, but obviously we need to get our kitties into a, a vet clinic if we do not know what it is that is causing this and it's getting excessive. Sometimes we can try to see if we can figure these things out ourselves first. Um, but if it is uh, on a more serious level, we need to you know make that vet visit right away. Um, but there are I, a lot I, of things that, yeah, but there are a lot of things that we can do um, to to help our cats if they have the the topical type issues like fleas or, or other parasites, um, um, ringworm, like mm -hmm. yeah. So Pam, what would you say are some tools and tricks for like the like this this basic simple reasons that our cats have itchy skin? Um. An imbalanced immune system, it typically comes down to a gut issue, right? Because that's where the immune system is. And if there is an imbalance or something off there, then you're going to see those symptoms spill over onto the surface. Yeah. Um, even, even with fleas and mm -hmm and uh, ringworm and these type of topical issues. And I, I love that you just, you just brought it real immediately. I, I was sort of like kind of work to that, but that's, but that's, but that's true, right? Like mm -hmm. the one thing that we've learned is fleas are attracted to the weakest of hosts and that goes for any parasite, right? But yep. they're attracted to the weakest of hosts. So I can tell you how many, especially during the peak of flea season, how many people come to us and they're like, I don't understand a lot of people, you know, beautiful people in the cat community do rescues and fostering and things like that. And they've got their cats together, but these cats have no issue in the same home with fleas, but these other cats are just covered in fleas and it all goes back to the gut imbalance, right? It really does. It really does. So I think one of the first things that you have to do is look at what you're feeding oftentimes, because, you know, whatever goes in the mouth ends in the gut. So what is contributing or what could potentially be contributing to stress or imbalance there if it's food? Um, one of the first things I obviously tell people is what are, well, ask them was, what are you feeding? You right. know, what kind of diet are you feeding? Because that goes a long way. If we don't, if we don't get the diet right, you can't out supplement a bad diet. No. Nope. No, it's true. true. It's true. And I just like to go back to fleas, just because this is a super passion point for Adrian mm -hmm. and I, I do want to say that there are so many options out there that where we can get these fleas under control without using the harsh chemical um, flea treatments that you get over the counter or at your vet's office. Um, we see so many side effects, scary, scary, long-term right. side effects from using these, um, these chemical flea treatments. So we, uh, we are very passionate about letting cat parents know that there are a ton of options out there of, of natural, healthy ways that we can still treat fleas, kill fleas, kill fleas, larva and eggs, all of it without mm -hmm. using these harsh chemicals. So, um, and like you said, we need to, we need to decide if that is the, the, the issue, right? So exactly like you said, when it comes, when it comes to the root cause, let's go back a step. You know, if, do you know, you've got fleas? There's no point in treating topically, you know, medicine, um, spot on natural stuff, anything. There's no point in doing anything unless you know what you're dealing with, you know? So mm -hmm. like you said, like, have you got fleas? So as you said, Jay, like first, check, you know, first port of court is a vet check, you know, and, and obviously there may be some cats that don't cope well with travel or don't cope well at the vets. But like, you know, if you notice a change in your cat, their skin, they're itching more, you start to see sore bits. We can always look for stuff and ways to help, but you do need to make sure that there's not something else going on that, you know, needs to have that kind of medical tr treatment. And I, and I agree with what Pam said, you know, diet plays a big part. And, you know, when it comes to fleas, like, what can you see on your cat? You know, yep. is that, you know, so we, we've had it an instance this summer, actually, first year we've ever had it where Leo had harvest mites, which I think you guys call them something different. 
Lies. Um, Lice. No, there's no, no. Um, Chiggers. Yes, yes. I was going to say, Katie told me the name, and it was some fucking some. It was some weird. Sorry, 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 sorry. It was some I weird. They are weird name. Chiggers. Chiggers. Never. Yeah. So, wow. what I noticed, he kept like chewing at his paw, you know, and I'm mm. like, dude, what is going on there? Because it was out of his normal. And when I went to give him his asthma inhaler one day, I noticed that chiggers are evil. Jennifer, I totally agree. Um, I noticed that I was like, oh, he's got dust, dust on his paw, like that, to brush it off. And I was like, and I'm not going to curse. I'll try not to curse. I was like, (laughs) oh my gosh, but worse. It was like his paw was like moving, right? It was disgustingly gross, like really, 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 really gross. And I'm like, right, we're going to the vets. Because I don't know what this is. I have no way of understanding. I can Google it. And I did Google it. I had a good Google. I love a good Google. But I was like, I, I, you know, I need to find, (laughs) I need to find more. I I need help. You know, (laughs) why is that funny? I'm I'm talking to use that. I have a good Google. I love a good Google. And go on. Sorry. Sorry. Well, what did what what result did you get? Like, did you? So, so we went to the vets. Oh, so before I went, I because I'm a super sleuth, I got some of the bugs and put them in a bag. Right, I got some tweezers, oh. I put some on a tissue, and I put some in a bag. So we, I've got little teeny tiny like little square plastic bags, and I took some with me. Some were dead, some were alive. It was disgusting, but we and I, and I couldn't actually take Leo because he doesn't travel very well. So I checked Baby Max. He had them too on his back paws, mm-hmm. and I'm like, "Oh my god, my house is infested!" Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna barf. Like it was gross. So I took baby Matt because he travelled better. Said to the vet, "This is what's on my cats." He put it under the microscope. Came back, said to me, "It's early, but it's harvest mites." And I'm like, "I may vomit." I was like, "Okay, what, what do I do with that?" <laughs> so he said to me, "You've got two choices. One, take a tablet." I'm like. How how does giving them a tablet and putting something in their bloodstream and their tummy help what's on their paws? Can you explain that to me? Which he couldn't. Second mm-hmm. option, use a basically like a spot on, but a spray. And I'm like, well, how does that work? Because Leo's asthmatic. How how can I spray something that's a chemical topical application on my asthmatic cat? So I said, thank you very much for your information. I'm going to go away and do my own research. So I basically sat with it. And the first thing that I did is I was like, right, what do I know? I know that green clay powder Mm -hmm. is antifungal, antibacterial, and like green clay powder is amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, right, I can make my own. I can make my own fungicidal spray type dust. So basically, I got some neem oil. I mixed it in, which the recipe, oh, wrong book. The recipe uh, is in here. Actually, it's Nyana's recipe for a flea treatment. So it was neem oil, green clay, and she uses something else, but I didn't have it. So I was like, right, we'll give it a go. And basically, twice a day for about a week, I mm-hmm. used a like a makeup brush, you know, like a small little brush, and I dusted it on their paws morning and evening, and they were gone within a week. Oh, so yeah. nice. Okay, so j- just have to throw out there. I know this is about itchy skin, and I think that, and I and I love this, and so I have to throw out there so everybody can just hear that again what julianne did is what we highly recommend for every cat parent right Mm -hmm. is that we need our vets we need their direction we need their guidance we need the information and, and diagnosis right but that doesn't mean we always need their resolution or their treatment we know our cats best and what you did could make me cry right now because it is so beautiful and we literally actually just did skits on that with Dr. Katie a couple of weeks ago at Thriving Pet Expo, speaking just about this, which is how you can speak to your vet and say, thank you. Thank you for this. I'm going to do my own research first. I'll come back if I can't find anything else, but I, I'm going to do my own research first because I know my cat best. And I feel like there's another option out here. You might not have that. Um, somebody else may. So I'm going to, I'm going to, that is just, that's just a great thing for all of us to know yeah. as cat parents is that we need our vets, but that doesn't necessarily mean we always need their um, solutions. They don't, they're, they're, their solution, like they have, you know, they have a, they have solutions. That's not the only solution. Sorry, Adrian, Correct. what were you yeah. going to say, my love? 
Yeah. Well, no, that, that's just it. That uh, so often we go because it is so. Whether it's urinating outside the box, whether it's itchy skin, whatever it may be, you notice something weird. Let's not just be like, oh, well, that's interesting. Let's do a vet visit. So let's figure figure out what's going on. But oftentimes it's just the beginning because you take something like this and bring into account, are they eating well? Are they pooping and peeing all right? Are they all, is their energy normal? And then whether, I mean, something like this is obvious, right? But if your cat is stable and happy and whatever, but we're just dealing with this, oftentimes that vet visit is the starting spot to help mm -hmm. get more information that can only be gotten from our teammate veterinarian. But then we can go and do exactly as you did because those treatments for an asthmatic cat or for any cat that is dealing with parasites, it's uh, it's it's actually going to weaken their whole overall immune system by mm -hmm. chemical yeah. toxin that their body has to flush through. It's not just getting rid of the problem. Their body is still dealing with that, which I know I, Pam, Pam deals so often with people that are now having to do a detox from something that was uh, given internally. Right. And and essentially it makes them more susceptible to the same issues in the future yeah. at, because we're weakening the immune system. Like Pam said, yeah. the, you know, mm -hmm. the cats are attracted or the, the parasites are attracted to the weakest of hosts. And so if they get on your kitty and they have a lower immune system, a, a, a weakened immune system, then they're going to, you know, uh, take over more easily yeah. than, um, than others. So I think, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I think that's, that's beautiful. Now, going back to gut health and uh, food, right? The other very common reason that cats get itchy skin is diet related, um, oftentimes an allergy, right? So there's different types of allergies. And Pam, you're like the expert when it comes to allergies, in my opinion. So I want you to speak <laughs> to the allergies, the different types of allergies that cats deal with, and then how we can uh, go about helping those things. Well, Sometimes it's an allergy. Sometimes it's just a sensitivity right. because there's a difference. And people think that, I don't know that people are familiar with the concept of just sensitivity, you know, yes. um, an allergy is when the body has an actual immune response to something. So you might see hives and redness and it's, you know, in like anaphylactic shock is an immune response to something that is paralyzing the body's ability to, you know, process something like a bee sting or whatever and swelling and their throat swells up or their face swells up and things like that. That's an allergic reaction, but a sensitivity might just be, you know, a rash or the itching and things like that. So I, I find that oftentimes there's a food sensitivity, but not necessarily an allergy, so to speak. Um, so, and oftentimes you might look at what they're feeding. Are they feeding a dry food diet? Are they feeding a bunch of plant protein that their body is not able to break down and metabolize because they're not designed to eat that? I see it a lot with corn and wheat and legumes, legume products that can cause irritation. But also I think you have to look at even the common proteins like chicken and fish that are in everything. You know, it, it can be more susceptible if that's all you're feeding. That cat is the same protein over and over and over again. I think they have a, a greater potential of developing a food sensitivity to that same protein versus if we diversify their gut a little bit more. Have, have you guys seen that as well? Yeah, to we've seen point, it with your, our own with our own cats. Um, to your point, though, of you saying that it's in everything, I want to specify that that could be like, oh, the lamb recipe or the turkey recipe or the beef recipe. If you look at the ingredients, which is what we had to do with our Pooh Bear, you recognize that there's a fish broth or a chicken byproduct or something in there. So mm -hmm. it means Diligent. that she's saying that you got to read the ingredients, even if you yeah. think I've been feeding a chicken or fish pate or whatever, I'm going to switch to something else look at those ingredients because oftentimes you've got to do a little extra sleuthing yeah. to really yeah. figure out that protein. Get your big magnifier out because it's very fine print yeah. and it's probably listed, you know, it'll say a tuna product or even a rabbit product. And we think, Oh, it's rabbit. But if you look at the list, it's like, Oh, five ingredients down. It says chicken, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's not just rabbit. Right. Right. Times, or it's not just lamb. Those are more expensive proteins. So they just throw in, you know, the cheaper protein to kind of bring the proteins level, levels up. Yep. Um, 
and keep the cost down. So yeah, <laughs> we have to realize that a lot of times. Yeah. And if there's not, you know, that's, that's not a bad thing if your cat's mm -hmm. not having a sensitivity to fish or chicken, right? Like it's, it's still like, oh, we're diversifying the gut because we're feeding different types of protein. So that's okay. Right. But if you, but it's so important that if, and I will say sensitivity, yes, you, I have yet to hear any veterinarian say sensitivity. They mm -hmm. will always say food allergy. I believe it's a food allergy, right? People come to us every single day and they're like, the vet said my cat has a food allergy. I don't know what to do. They want to put them on this hydrolyzed protein diet, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what to do. And then we have to go through the process of explaining what that is and how you as the pet parent can go through an elimination diet. And just like you said, here are the very common sensitivities. If you're feeding a dry food, mm -hmm. that, you know, they're look and see if you see wheat, gluten, if you see corn, soy, all of these ingredients that are hypoallergenic. If you, if, is that the right word? Hyper, 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 hyper allergenic um, for our kitties. But so then obviously we're always going to coach to wean off of uh, dry food in general, but the fish and chicken are very, very common. And then we just have to read those ingredients and, and switch them to a, to a better protein. And you'll see, how long do you typically see when you switch somebody to a different, we're yeah. thinking the same, when you switch someone uh, or when you help a, a cat parent switch to a, a new protein or a new diet, how long does it typically take for, for those symptoms to subside? Oh gosh, days. Like yeah. almost within a couple of days. Yeah. Because it takes a while for the old stuff to process out through the body once you stop feeding that. But within days, you could see a reduction in symptoms and itchiness and things like that. So that's your clue. It's like, huh, what was I feeding before? And now I'm not feeding that. So, wow, that's very interesting. Um, if you take a break for like three months of that old protein that was causing a lot of stress, sometimes you can reintroduce it and it's fine again. The body just needs a break, you know? Mm -hmm. So we don't need to overload it. And I also, I saw a comment over here about someone who struggles to find something without uh, fish products. Um, fish oil is not always the stressor, but the fish product. Like, so if your cat is, has a sensitivity to, to salmon or tuna. Tuna is probably real common. Um, it doesn't mean that you couldn't do a salmon oil or a tuna oil or an anchovy oil because that's a fat, not a protein. So just be mindful of that. So it, you don't necessarily have to limit yourself to the omegas if your cat has a, a fish sensitivity because it's not yeah. the same thing. Well, and you think about how common uh, food allergies and sensitivities probably more commonly are mm -hmm. for itchy skin. But another great example of sometimes it's not about giving your cat something because I think that's what we want is an instant relief yep. for them, right? Like the comeback is always like, well, your cat is very uncomfortable. I just want to go ahead and give it this immune suppressant. So the body stops reacting. Like a Topica. But mm -hmm. right, we're not mm -hmm. what the issue is when instead we can go home and be like, okay, is this more of a food sensitivity? Let's try something else. Wait a few days to mm -hmm. see what are, is a reduction in symptoms. And yeah. instead of having added something that is taking a toll on their immune system in general, now we've taken something away and we're getting to the root cause. Yeah, we're getting to the root of the of the issue. And yeah. Pam, uh, Pooh Bear was just like that. So it was, uh, you know, yeah. well, I took him to the vet. I did like you did, uh, Julianne. And they said that he had, um, it was actually rodent ulcers, but still topical issues. And they said uh, steroids. And I was like, uh, of course, you know, I being in this industry so long, I'm like just hesitant to jump to steroids immediately. So I was like, let me do my own research first and I'll get back to you. Um, and I came home and I did a good Google and I had, I, I, had a, I had a good Google and I uh, and I found out that uh, this exact information that uh, for the cats, first time <laughs> for the first time that cats uh, can be uh, uber sensitive to certain proteins like chicken and fish. I think I learned it from Dr. Karen Becker and mm -hmm. I um, and I he everything he was eating had fish in it and he was Ever. on a canned diet at the time. So I was like, oh, OK, because he loved it. So it was like, great. But then it was like, and we have five other cats at the time. So I'm like, 
okay, what are we going to do? So we switched all of them off of um, fish and we just got a bunch of different variety of different proteins. Um, and you're right. It took a few days before we started seeing a reduction, it took about two weeks to see nothing again, mm -hmm. like no, like you could see them getting better and then they disappeared in two weeks. Um, and we were like, yes, no steroids needed. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So we can, you, we can, we can do these, uh, you know, we could be proactive as pet parents too, when it comes to Marilyn Bickle, my love, uh, she is here with an interesting question. I want to see if either yeah. one of you have an idea. Could it be that it was what the chicken was being fed that causes an allergic reaction or a sensitivity and not the chicken itself? Like if you were to do a free range, happy bird versus a the super farmed out antibiotic filled uh, chicken, which I'm not sure we get that choice in a lot of the cat foods that we feed. Right. Um, have you, do you guys, have you guys had, did you guys see that thumbs up? Did you see that? Her, I did. her computer has been doing if that I so do much this, lately. <laughs> I don't know. We don't know I, what it is. It's a, we must have accidentally turned it on. I don't know. It's doing it during our morning meetings too. And we're like, what is, what that? is that? But have you guys ever heard of that? Or do you think that that is uh, a contributing factor to some of these sorting? I, go ahead, Julian. Go ahead. Uh, possibly. I think it depends what, you know, what, what you're feeding. Like if it's raw, then yes, quite possibly that could have a bigger impact than if it's wet or canned or, you know, processed, you know, I mean, it depends how the, the chicken is prepared, you know, is it lightly mm -hmm. cooked because then you're going to change the composition of it compared to if it was raw. So yes, if you're feeding an organic, you know, beautiful flying and, you know, fluffy chicken versus like you said, a cage, you know, antibiotic fed versions mm -hmm. that is going to impact their cells, you know, it, 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 which obviously will impact their, um, their joints, their tissues, their muscles, for sure, for sure. So, I mean, that's why I think, you know, I say, and I'm sure that you three, and I'm sure Katie as well says it, say, you know, do the best you can with what you've got. So what's the best you can afford? What's the best quality you can get hold of? What's the best brand that you can offer? If you can, if you're not comfortable with raw, can you do wet? You know, can you do fresh? Do the best you can with what you've got. So it, yes, I think it could potentially be that. Is it something that you're likely to ever get an answer to? Mm, probably not. There is unlikely to be a test or a way to investigate that to figure that out. What about well, you, Pam? Oh, sorry. Go on, darling. No, no, no. Go ahead, Pam. No, I was just going to say um, it absolutely can. And if you think about especially fish, I learned this from Poppy Phillips. There are finding studies are finding that there's actually mycoplastics in right. seafood. So your cat may not be reacting necessarily to the tuna, but to the heavy metals or the plastics that are there absorbing and things like that. And, you know, antibiotics or whatever the chicken may have been the genetically modified feed that they were eating or stuff like that. But here's where, where your testing can come in. So if you're not familiar, is it VDI labs or is it IPL? I think it's IPL that does the, um, sensitivities that you can t send in a test kit you can they can get a test kit from um that tests like dr jean dodds does her her yep. test kit but i think it's um Chemo. I think it's innovative pet labs does a sense no not them no 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 it's yukari yukari has a test kit that you can send in a sample of their saliva i believe and they can figure out what they're sensitive to and what comes up on their testing results. Oh, cool. that's awesome. If you mm -hmm. can drop a link to that, yeah, even if it's after that. this, if you can drop a link or someone on your team can drop a link to that, that would be awesome and, and helpful for the audience. Um, and I will say that I learned from Billy Hookman from uh, Green Juju, um, past in uh, at Answers, that um, I've always said that chicken is the like, one of the highest um, inflammatory meats, right? Because, mm -hmm. and, I've, and I had learned that it's like on a, on a scale of like omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids, we're looking at like 19 to one. So that's what makes it so inflammatory is that the omega-6s are so high and omega-3s are so low. And then I learned from Billy that um, it does depend, Marilyn, on the the raising of that actual chicken because the chickens that they were raising at the time had like it was almost a, a one to one ratio they were as very far happy as like well yeah birds. 
And so the, so the chicken that they were putting into their pet food, pet food was uh, not inflammatory. Like the majority of factory farm chicken um, is. So yes. yes. And Pam just dropped the, the link for our sensitivity test. testing kits. Mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah. super helpful. It's cool because it doesn't necessarily just test food, but you know, environmental it's, it's a very like comprehensive. I love that. So let's yeah. move on to environmental allergies because that's another reason the cats get itchy skin on a regular basis. And that is like the hardest to like figure out just as a cat parent, right? Like if you're just like a, a regular cat parent and my cat's itching and I don't know what it is, how do you know what, what in the environment might be causing that itchy skin? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a couple things. Number one, itchy skin, environmental stuff is not normal. It's common, but it's not normal. Let's make sure there's a distinction there. Um, we have to look at why the immune system is out of balance. So if you want to peel back layers a little bit deeper, I think environmental stuff can be like a secondary trigger to a, an immune system that's already having issues and overstimulated somehow, and they just can't mount a normal histamine response to things like trees and weeds and pollens and things like that. Yep. So my, what's commonly causing that is the vaccines, but we can get to that in a second. Environmental stuff. I've, I've shared this a lot on podcasts. If you can find like a web-based resource that will show you like the air quality in your area. What is blooming right now? I use pollen.com, www.pollen.com, and it will pull up the top three environmental allergens in the air, whether it's weeds, grasses, trees, pollens, whatever. And you can start to journal and start to keep a record of, okay, my cat is really starting to be so itchy rate or their ears are flicking a lot and they're, you know, they're doing all of this. A lot of times that's just histamine from the, the little molecules, the pollen molecules that are tickling and in causing an, a histamine response. So I would start to pay attention to what's going on in your air. You know, even if an indoor cat starts to have this kind of stuff, I remind people that your HVAC system pulls in fresh air from the outside. So Every time you open and close your door and come in and out of your home, that fresh air is coming in and it's not always being filtered through your, your, you know, your air filters and your HVAC and things like that. So even cats that are indoors and don't go out can be sensitive to allergens in the air and pollens and things like that too. Yep, absolutely. And I want to, I also want to throw in there that uh, the studies have shown that one of the most common allergies that um, indoor cats um, or that, that trigger indoor cats is actually our household cleaners. So a lot of times it's not even what's in the air outside, um, which this would be also unfortunately common, um, but not even necessarily like it's the amount of chemicals that you're using, mm -hmm. especially consistently over time, which will weaken your cat's immune system, right? So yeah. plug-ins, air freshener, mm -hmm. Um, even some like the, not the true essential oils, but the synthetic essential oils, the, the, um, floor cleaners and the counter cleaners, like your cats will walk around this. They have to breathe all of this in mm -hmm. and it's a very common trigger for allergies and cats, allergies and cats. Um, because, uh, and just because we don't know usually, right? Like, I mean, right. I know for so long and we had so many issues, even an asthmatic cat had no idea that it was also because asthma and allergies are, are often triggered by indoor uh, chemicals in the home. And um, yeah. it's, it's crazy the amount of chemicals that have been tested. And this is mm -hmm. the scientific um, in cats specifically more so than dogs and way more so than humans. Our cats, our household cats are um, it's in their bloodstream. Now it's concentrated in their bodies because yeah. of the, the chemicals that we use in the home. I have a story to share. Oh, go sorry, ahead. Go on, Pam. No, go on. No. Um, my, my cat, Lily, at our old house, would a, oftentimes spend a lot of time in my ex's office, which was upstairs. And he liked 
burning certain candles or spraying the the air freshener. You know, there was a bathroom right around the corner and she would start to scratch and have red skin. And I, I, of course me, you know, muscle test everything. And I figured out it was an irritant from the pollutants, the, the chemicals that she was being exposed to because she was in his vicinity. Right. So I was, I said, you've got to stop using that shit because I didn't want it. You know, I don't, I don't want that kind of stuff in my home to begin with. So that was always a point of contention you know, so X. <laughs> <laughs> one of the reasons. Um, so, yeah. And it's interesting because when that stopped, when I could show him like, look, this is what it's doing to her. And she's sitting in that environment and it went away, you know, and she was miserable. She was just, you know, constantly just scratching and itching and it was red and her eyes would water real bad. I'm like, mm mm you got to yeah. stop. You got to stop. So we just don't realize, like you said, how polluted our, our indoor air quality is with all the stuff we put in our homes. <laughs> yep. Yep. Julia, yeah. you're about to say, especially since you have an asthmatic baby, you were about to yeah. say something. I, yeah, I echo what you guys say about, you know, what, what are we using in the home? So cleaning products, that's definitely something to think of. Fabric softeners, washing liquid, you know, what do you wash your sheets in? Mm -hmm. You know, fabric softener, again, there's, there's new um, research that's come out. I don't have the links, but Nyana, my co-author, mentioned it to me. That there are studies now that show that fabric softener, you know, it gets into um, mother's milk and newborn babies and stuff. So basically it gets absorbed by the skin. You know, so like, are you, you know, what products are you using in the house? And, and, and actually, like you said, Jay, I would include essential oils can be potentially toxic, you know, because the scent molecules, whether it's concentrated or diluted, you know, um, synthetic or natural, that's still a chemical. You know, it's, it's still a, a scent p particle that cats can have on their coats. So if, you know, we're talking about itchy cats. We've talked about how you can support them internally, diet, nutrition, gut health, you know, and also there's the topical side. So there is the two pronged approach to it. So if you've got reed diffusers, if you're burning out, you know, I, I love essential oils, but I use it with self-selection. You know, the cat has the choice. If you're constantly burning essential oils, it might smell lovely for you, but cats liver, they don't, their livers don't function the same way that ours do. So we've, we've talked about a compromised immune system. If you weaken a part of the body so if you're burning say essential oils or reed diffusers you know the scentsy candle waxy melt things oh, I, they're very very sensitive to smell i don't like them so we don't have them in our house um the cat's body is working overtime to process that from mm -hmm. the air you know so they've already got in a, in a way a compromised immune system from being exposed to that in their environment then you that like you said pam that leads to a sensitivity because they're diminished in one aspect Mm -hmm. So, you know, what cleaning products are you using? How often are you using them? And what is the cat exposed to? They walk on your floors. How often are you mopping your floor with bleach or with a concentrated, cut, you know, floor cleaner? How are you, you know, what are you doing with the dishes? You know, we have a dishwasher, but I also rinse the boys' plates before I put the food because if I get it straight from the dishwasher, that's had a nice tablet in there to clean my dishes, you know? So do I want them to be licking that? No, not really. So it, it, it's... There's always more we can do. And I appreciate sometimes people may feel overwhelmed because we talk about so much in these round tables. We cram so much information in. But what is the one thing that resonates for anybody watching? You know, you don't have to think about all the things that we've talked about. We're trying to give you guys some hints and tips and different avenues to explore. We we don't have um, cleaning products in the, in the house that I use frequently. I have a lot of natural things, you know, so I mix up my own. I will clean when the boys are out, you know, and I I don't use the scent stuff. That being said, Leo still has asthma attacks. You know, he still has coughing. I still have to use steroids at times. We don't do it all the time. We're now starting to offer him bone broth in his dinner, which he absolutely loves to support his gut health. You know, so we, we're trying to do different things to support him. And like Pam said, though, we've we I've noticed that now when we start to, we're in autumn but as we start to get rainier leo coughs more he doesn't do well with a damp environment can mm. i control the rain 
absolutely not. I mean, I'm good people, but not that good, you know, so I can't, I can't affect that. But I'm aware that the moisture in the air has an impact for him. So, you know, is there a way I can help support him with a, a dehumidifier in the house or whatever it may be? Yeah. You know, I know that when we have a Christmas tree, I didn't have one last year, but every time we've had a Christmas tree before that, when we've had Leo, he coughs more. So I'm like, hmm, I'm, I probably won't have a real one this year because there is something in that, you know, the type of tree, like Pam said, I, I'm going to, I made a note of that pollen website. I am so all over that one. So I think, you know, it it's a question of looking at what's what can you do what have you explored already you know and taking a step trying one thing at a time like don't yeah. don't try too many things in one go because if I've made that mistake with pickle before yeah. before I knew that I could question the vet before I knew that I could ask for a second opinion or I could use my own methods to support the vet's diagnosis with things I just did what the vet said blindly. So, yeah. you know, no peeps that you can ask questions. You can pause before treatment if it's appropriate and you feel like it's the right thing to do and try one thing at a time. You know, we yeah. made too many changes all at once. And sometimes with Leo, I'll be at desperation point and, you know, I'll try to change in two or three things. And then I don't know what's made an impact. Right. And That's the other thing to say is like, uh, sorry, Jay, go on, darling. I'm just chatting yeah. with me. Keep going, keep going. I love it. And your accent I can listen to you all day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other thing to say is, which we haven't mentioned, and I'm, and I'm going to say this last bit, and then Pam, I'm totally handed over to you for the vaccine stuff, is um, our energy. You know, when we're worried about our cats, what happens? We freak out. We love them so much. For some of us, they are our whole world, and we freak mm -hmm. out because we love them and what happens then that changes our vibration it changes our energy it changes how we feel it changes what our cats can feel so just bear that in mind if you're dealing with I'm sorry I'm gonna have to curse but if you're dealing with a shit show with your cat whether that's itchy skin or some other problem take a breath peeps because mm -hmm. it can be really hard and that's okay it's okay that it's hard <sighs> But it's okay to just pause and to take one step and to try one thing or to get one piece of advice or to follow, you know, one method of, of trying something new. But just be kind to yourself if you're dealing with this. Something like itchy skin, it could be a quick fix. It could you could make changes and, and see things, you know, turn themselves around. Or I'm sure there's some of you on here that have been dealing with itchy cats for months, you yeah. know. And if that's the case, like we feel you. And maybe, you know, reach out to some of us, see if we can help you more. But just take a moment to look at how far you've come and look at how much you're doing for your cats and know that you're trying your best and they know that too. Yeah, I love that. And I um, I, I really want to, I want to get to the stress factor for itchy skin as well. Um, so we're, so, cause you guys, cause this is like the team. And then I have somebody I need to introduce you guys to. Oh my gosh. We, yes. we, oh, we're, we're, this go. is going to be a fun one. But, okay. But, but real quick, real quick. Yeah. Just, I want to just go back to environmental allergies to give some, um, value to the audience as far as certain things that you can do. Um, they're not overwhelming. Um, when it comes to household cleaners, vinegar and water guys, the only thing that you have to get over, and I'm saying this from experience because I was a freak about the good smells. I had the plugins, I had the air freshener, I had the, the bleach, the good smelling cleaner, like all of that stuff was my jam. I needed my house to smell. I thought I needed my house to smell like it was a fresh, clean thing, right? Um, so the only thing that you have to get over personally as a human is the having that that aroma in your home. Um, but vinegar and water is the cheapest, easiest mm -hmm. way. Amazing. You're going to save a ton of money and you're going to clean just as well. In fact, in, I don't know if you guys have laminate floors, it cleans our laminate floors way better than those Swiffers and the, all those other cleaners that we would spend concentrated yeah. cleaners that we would spend a lot more on. We're saving a ton of money on these, on, on cleaning with like just, natural stuff. There's also some, you know, natural things that you can purchase if you need to wean yourself off of that smell that do have the, you know, natural lava, the natural you know, smells, smells but it's but not all synthetic. And, and, am I, am I, a little bit. Okay. okay. Remember, 
That worked. Well. Oh man. Okay. Anyway, so environmental allergies, if it's in the home, like a, a household toxins, then vinegar and water. If it is an, a, an allergy out, like an environmental allergy to pollens and weeds and things like that, there are immense studies on the powers of omega-3 fatty acids mm -hmm. and using this on your cats for, um, or in your cats for, um, for reducing inflammation and really helping allergies for environmental pollens, things like that. But back to Pam's point, what I, I, Julianne was just going to kick it back to talk about vaccines, because yes. as you mentioned earlier, I, that cats having a reaction to the great outdoors, grass, trees, weeds, whatever it is, it's no, not no, natural. No. It's common, but it's not natural. And you wanted to uh, share a bit about what you've learned as far as what's causing that kind of reaction for many Getting cats. to the root. Yeah, I don't think people realize, and maybe a lot of people in this audience do, but like in general, I don't think people have connected the dots and looked at the timelines of when they took their cats in for their annual vaccines, and then they start to see the immune responses, the itching, the licking, the fur pulling, um, you know, scratching, hives, whatever it might be. And sometimes they start within days. Sometimes they start within 30 days, three months. I mean, there is something triggering the immune system. And it's typically the vaccine ingredients, the heavy metals. Um, these are toxins. And the, the whole point of a vaccine is to stimulate an immune response. But sometimes that gets way over ramped, right? And the body doesn't really have an off switch, especially when you have a cat that's been revaccinated over and over and over. It's like you just keep pouring more toxins into that body that's 10 pounds, you know, <laughs> and there's no off switch and there's no elimination of that of those things. So right. I think we have to be smarter about how often we are, re are vaccinating, and, and we've talked about this in other shows, so you guys can go watch those, those episodes about over-vaccination and all that. If you haven't seen it, go watch that because we talk a, a lot about this. But we've got to stop doing the stuff that's causing a lot of these problems because, like I said, there's usually a, a, a base root cause and then the environmental stuff is just like the icing on top. It's just another symptom. It's a layer to show you that something is off, but this isn't, it's not normal for, for a cat to be allergic to ragweed. It's no. not normal for them to not be able to go in the grass or even if they're indoors to have, you know, allergic reactions and itching and all this kind of stuff. We have to take those toxins out of the body those heavy metals out of the body. We have to stop overstimulating the immune system so that we can stop that cytokine storm. And then when the body can calm down and the immune system can heal, and there's steps that you can take to healing the immune system, sealing the leaky gut, um, soothing and calming the inflamed tissues in the gut lining. That's a part of that whole process. We have to take those steps so that the immune system can calm down and yeah. then they won't be itching and going crazy all the time, you know, um, do the steps that we suggested on cleaning up your household, you know, air, air quality and toxins and things like that. And a lot of people in this audience are doing that or have done that already. So if you're still having issues, just start to start to go back and look at how long it's been going on and what happened right before that started. Because yeah. a lot of times that's a clue like, huh, you know, yeah. it was the time I put that flea medication on them or had, you know, or got their vaccines and it was about 30 days later. And that's when I started seeing all this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it snowballs. Yeah. And you think I about the amount of a vaccine, right? When you're saying 10 pounds, a lot of these, we see it a lot in like shelter cats that yeah. are, you know, taken in as kittens and they're vaccinated and they're dewormed and they're fixed and all the all stuff this. before they're sick. And then a year or two down the road is yeah. when it's like, oh my God, they're allergic to everything. Nice. Yeah. I, I wish <laughs> I, I'm, I'm missing Dr. Katie very much right now because I think that I know we're already running out of time, but 
I think that just a, a small conversation on the detox pathways, you know, you said whether it's he heavy metals, whether it's the contaminants, the toxins, the chemicals, but the body needs to get rid of that and how important those detox pathways are. At and Thriving Pet Expo, uh, Rita Hogan, the amazing herbalist, gave an incredible uh, lecture on the mm -hmm. lymphatic system and how much that works. But I think, um, you know, we use milk thistle to help with some natural detoxing of the yeah. liver. What are what are a couple of tips that you have of things that people can just kind of pulse? We live in a very toxic world. So it's not like, oh, I have to do this because of that. Sometimes it's just a healthy thing to kind of put into the routine of something yeah. that's helpful with the detox. What are some of your top recommendations? Well, before you do any kind of a detox work, I want to make sure that those drainage pathways are open. So even if you took two weeks and did some burdock root or the Newton detoxifier for pets to open those drainage pathways, the worst thing you can do is skip the lymphatic support part first, because then you're just throwing, you're, the body's not eliminating the toxins and it, they can actually make them, the pet feel worse, you know, because they're just recirculating. So it can look like it's worse. Um, but having something like the Animal Essentials Detox Blend that includes the milk thistle plus great herbs for lymphatic support or liver defense by Animal Essentials, those are, it's milk thistle dandelion, you know, so those combinations address both parts, the, the I think Katie calls it the first detox, first detox and the second detox pathway, so lymphatic and then liver. Um, and then if you know that your cat has had flea or tick meds or vaccines with heavy metals, add something like a heavy metal cleanse. You know, it can be like the one that I love because it's just literally a drop is the heavy metal chemical binder by Global Healing. It's literally a drop and it doesn't taste bad. Um, you can use something like that. You could use zeolite. Um, something that's going to bind that metal or those chemicals and get them out of the body a lot faster. So, yeah. And pulsing, you know, we live in a toxic world. So it's not like a one and done. And I'm not saying go crazy. But every, you know, like maybe once a quarter, you do a, just a, a mini detox, like do a week of lymphatic, do a week of milk the sulfur liver and then do a week of heavy metal or chemical stuff you know because they're exposed to stuff you know we all are we all so. are, right yeah no matter what it is mm -hmm. no matter how much we try to clean up our home we can't just like you can't make it stop raining julia right. we we can't we, we can't control the toxins in our in the air outside of our home right that we're just um especially right. in the states we're yeah, riddled with and stuff that's in the food, you know, even even well-meaning pet parents who think they're feeding a very clean diet. Well, you don't know what that animal ate, just like Julianne was talking about, you know. So the processes and the stuff that they put in, the additives, and we don't know the sourcing all the time. So it's just smart to do those intermittent, you know, support, targeted support for liver and, you know, gut health and things like that, just to be proactive about it. Yeah. Agreed. Now, because I did not realize we've been talking this long, this is crazy, but I want it. I, I, I want to get to the, um, and this is not less common. In fact, I want to say it's probably more common that we see our cats itching, scratching over licking, um, over grooming themselves. Um, that's not necessarily due to itchy skin. Ah! I'm echoing again, whatever. Um, uh, but it, but it's also induced by stress and, mm -hmm. and stress and the stress of oftentimes, like you said, Julianne, the pet parent, right? Mm -hmm. um, we met, we had the pleasure and honor of meeting Dr. Barry Sands mm -hmm. uh, two weeks ago. And you two would literally just drool, with, like you would <laughs> absolutely freaking love her if you have it better yet you would absolutely freaking love her she is like she has an er vet of 15 years and i was just so fascinated by her very when you meet her there is much as with meeting you guys there's just this very incredible mm -hmm. vibe a very powerful and calm vibe it, it was really an incredible experience 
and we had the pleasure of hanging out with her afterwards. And she really kind of spoke, uh, especially your language, Julianne, about talking about being a cat therapist. I, uh, you know, and you've often said it, and I was going to say, in my experience, you're you're kind of a human therapist as well. I had an appointment with Julianne that you do a lot of healing for the human as well. And Dr. Barry was talking about, especially in her experience as an ER vet, how oftentimes cats will come in or pets will come in with conditions that are mirroring a condition a human has. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. she really recognized that they're part of the world she can heal. Yes, she can ER medicine, but uh, so much of it is in, in helping that human heal and how much the things that we take on. Talk about woo-woo girls. Wow, she has she has some. But it's not, I mean, she also has like a, a ton of science. She did like a, a huge lecture at AHBMA and has like the, the, the science of behind, what is, she, what is it called? Her, her was a quantum uh, biology. Quantum biology, right? And, and, and relating it to pets. I hate this echo. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but also just another uh, incredible resource and, and light in the world as far as like kind of helping us all connect the dots when we're dealing with anything that's out of bounds. Mm -hmm. What was, can you mention her name again? Got to, what was it? Barry Sands. Barry Sands, B-A-R-R-I-E and then Sands, S-A-N-D-S. She's not very active on social media, um, but we're going we're, we're gonna to push her to try to be a little bit, she's trying to get more active on social media, but we've, we've heard about her for years, I feel, but we finally got to meet her and she was, I mean, just blew our thoughts. Yeah. Amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. I just wanted to go back real quick before I forget to environmental stuff. Like I love using homeopathy. So homeopathy, homeopathic remedies are super, super easy to use with cats. So what I tell people is do a Google search, your best friend, Google, and look at homeopathy for itching, itchy skin. And you'll find tons of pages and sites look for the ones that are written by the Indians, the Indians like from the country, India, the doctors over there practice homeopathy. Uh, they are so well knowledgeable about this, but they're always, they're going to put remedies and they're going to put the rubrics or the descriptions next to them. And you can best match up your cat's symptoms with a remedy and find a remedy to address the itchy symptoms that your cat's going through. Yep. And so, yeah, using homeopathy is one of my favorite tools. Yeah. Do you put, you put Pooh Bear on some um, homeopathic remedies several nice. times that really helped his itchy skin because he had an autoimmune disease, which is another reason why um, many cats can. And also from being over vaccinated is why mm -hmm. he had that autoimmune disease. And so Pam had him through what we were putting him through. Like uh, he went through detoxes and then we did some homeopathic remedies wow. that worked so uh, beautifully wow. that we were able to wean him off of steroids uh, to keep those symptoms under control. So I, yeah, second that for sure. Girls, I'm looking, I know we had a late start today because our internet decided to poop out as soon as we uh, jumped on, uh, but we're already six minutes over. Um, and I know we got to wrap it up. Everyone got uh, some busyness to get to, but anything that we haven't uh, touched on or anything top of mind when it comes to itchy skin and causes or treatments go. Flame retardants. Yes. Flame retardants in your environment. And I had to do some research on this because I ended up writing an article about it because a lot of the, um, it's so interesting, uh, you know, client energy sessions coming up with like flame retardant energy, flame retardant energy. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I have to learn about this. Did you know that one of the most common sources of flame retardant, flame retardants is foam, foam like pillows, foam cat beds, foam dog beds, the squishy foam kind of stuff, the, the stuff that they put in your, your couch cushions, your parcel cushions, it's that could potentially be contributing to itchy skin. So that's just something else, you know, put your detective hat on and start looking through potential sources of flame retardants in your environment. Yeah, it, you know, it's, it's also one of the leading contributors, according to recent studies, of um, hyperthyroidism in cats. 
And, yeah. and we're finding that in so many different places, our furniture being number one, where you're like, what, how, like, why, you know, I mean, but they put flame retardants on these chemicals because they're so, because if your house catches on fire, they're just going to blow up if it, you know, if, but your couch if, is not, if your couch is not, it's a bomb. Yeah. So, so they put these, these uh, chemicals on it. Now they are coming out with um, new, uh, like now that this is being made aware, like people know more about flame retardants. They're mm -hmm. starting to come out with and, and ex, uh, disclose if it has, if the furniture that you're purchasing has flame retardants, but we're not mm -hmm. all going to be like, okay, I'm going to go sell my couch and get another no. one. I get yeah. that. Put a blanket over it. Right. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's simple to, to just kind of like keep it as far away mitigate from as much mitigate. as possible. And especially yeah. those new non flame retardant or whatever they are, are uh, expensive. they're really expensive. So nothing in our near future for sure. <laughs> so yeah, but it, mitigate as much as we can. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Julianne, Julianne, anything that, anything top uh, of mind? Herbs, herbs. Well, actually, I wasn't going to go herbs today. I know that you ladies do like your herbs. I know, I know, I can't. But I was going to say energy because when you sit, when you're working with energy with a cat, whether you're doing Reiki or healing or chakra work or whatever, when you see a cat flick and itch and do and scratch, that that is a sign of shifting energy. It's a sign of energy processing. So when you have a healing session with the cat, you might see them have a clean afterwards. That's them shifting energy. Mm -hmm. If you're working like sort of like at a distance, you may also notice that they kind of have a big a scratch or a flick or their fur ripples at the back. I'm not talking about high prestige. I'm talking about in that session. That's all signs of shifting energy. So it could be we've talked about so many options here tonight. And like Pam said, get your detective hat on. It could also be energy. If you're a super stressed person, if you are a stress ball in your home mm -hmm. and you, you know, you've got a problem with your cat and you know the vets can't find an issue with it, you've tried all the supplement, you know, you can't get to the bottom, you can't find the root cause, it might be energetic. It might be that your cat is shifting their energy and your energy by literally physically moving it off their body. So, you know, that that's why people generally come to me at the end of the, you know, the line when they've tried all these other things that we've talked about and then say to me, I don't know what else to do. I'm like, eh, it's probably energy. So, you know, the, the mm -hmm. skin, the, the body, you know, it's the largest organ that a cat has. So we've talked tonight about, you know, working and supporting it from the inside. There's things that you can do if you need topical support as well. And just don't forget the energy. You know, everything is made of energy, you know, and but there's a physical issue that's been an imbalance for a very long time. So my opinion, my perspective is get to the root, which is a potential energy imbalance and look at how you can support that. So that would be my my parting word. I love that. Oh, I love so that. Much. Now, I do have to say that I have also seen uh, recipes for herbal teas that you can use topically. Yeah. Uh, on your on your cats to it's a chamomile. non toxic right but soothing yep. chamomile. Mm -hmm. yeah. chamomile that's what I was gonna say I thought it was chamomile, mm -hmm. chamomile. Yeah. and peppermint peppermint soothing you know ginger can be cooling although it's warming if you ingest it so it depends what it is you're trying to do you know yeah. again I, aromatic, cat. Work. aromatic cat everything's in a book that you need the herbs hydrocells essential oils we talk about like you said using teas making herbs dried herd options there's so many so many options yes aromatic, and those... aromatic cat is really just a, i i feel like it's a little book it's a easy read you can look up something specific it's like a little guidebook i think everyone needs it, it is it is illuminating not just for mm -hmm. your cat specifically but just doing stuff that's enriching doing stuff for yourself there is so much information in there and it's super simple if you're just looking for something go to the index be like oh what, what would be great for this yep it's incredible yeah so we love it go, we keep it on, on amazon hand. and grab that book. yeah we keep it on hand it is on amazon also cat chakras is also on amazon which we yeah. get we have we haven't started yet but we i got, we just got annie it. um so uh so we'll talk about that after the live but um, yeah. Thank you guys so much oh, for yeah. joining us. Um, I can't believe Mike. we talked for over an hour. I know. We didn't even have the doctor with us. <laughs> the good doctor. We missed her, though. We did. Um, we did. She will be back at some point. But thank you to all of you that joined us on this beautiful Monday. Uh, We've oh got company we coming company up to our door, door right, right now. now. So we're going <laughs> to have to jump off. Um, but we, we love you guys so much. Yes, we love thank all you, of everyone. You. And um, we will be live tonight on uh, Facebook. 
YouTube, no, TikTok, then Instagram, then Facebook and YouTube, uh, starting at 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern. So uh, if you guys have other questions, come join us. If you guys want yes. more information from Julianne or Pam Roussel, link is in the description to their website. So we love you guys so much. Thank you for joining us. And we will see you very soon. Have a great Thank week. you, everyone. Bye, Bye. Pam.